Yeah, um, so we just need to get uh, Maggie connected, I believe. Uh, she's connected? Yeah. yeah, so she's already connected. Awesome. So we'll, I was just going to get uh, do an introduction of the panel, and then I'm just going to let the panelists introduce themselves. So we're going to get Maggie to introduce herself first. Just so she's uh, online on Zoom? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, just, I don't know if they already told you, but when she's speaking, mm -hmm. we have to mute your microphone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I didn't, but I, I do now. <laughs> okay. Uh, because um, otherwise there's like a loop and the sound is really, really bad. Yeah, yeah. So is it just a presentation of her or it's have you planned like a no, debate? It, it's her? more of a discussion type of thing. Okay, because it's quite difficult. Yeah, sorry. I wasn't even aware of, because um, Alex is one of the main okay. organizers. Yeah, we just problems. <coughs> hello. Oh, hello. Hello? Yeah. Hey everyone, we're just about to get started, so if you want to find a seat, that would be great. Um, firstly, I just want to thank the IGF for allowing us to have this panel today. We'll be discussing harm reduction on the internet, focusing on sex work and drug use, and the intersection between the two. This subject can obviously be quite difficult to for some folks, and we invite you to leave as necessary to look after your mental health. Um, so before we go on and introduce our amazing panelists, I just want to quickly go through some of the themes for today's session. And if you're going to have some discussions, could you please leave? Thanks. Um, so today's themes are how do we ensure that internet legislation and regulation regarding sex work, drugs, and cybersecurity results in less harm for sex works, drug users and abusers, the LGBTQI community, survivors of abuse, and human trafficking victims. How do we ensure the unintended consequences of this regulation do not further foster societal exclusion and expose those groups to harm? How do we ensure the attempts by social networking platforms to clean up sexual and drug-related content does not result in exclusion and direct harm of vulnerable groups? At the end of today's workshop, we'll be collecting the contributions from our panelists, our on-site and offline audience, and that will help inform our report on policy recommendations on the topics discussed today. Can we please get Maggie connected so she can introduce herself?
the outcome of their pregnancy. Hi, okay, it looks like there were some technical difficulties, so I'm gonna go ahead and start one more time. My name is Maggie Mayhem. I am from San Francisco, California, and I am the founder of Harm Redux SF. We are a very small grassroots harm reduction program that provides health and hygiene supplies to stimulant users um, who are marginally housed or homeless in San Francisco. I am also formerly of the board of directors of the Sex Worker Project, Sex Worker Outreach Project USA. And I'm also uh, on the leadership team of the Bay Area Doula Project, and that provides support to um, people for any outcome of a pregnancy or lack thereof. Awesome, thanks for that, Maggie. Um, next, we're going to introduce Lola. Hey, um, oh, is that working? Hello? Is this on? Yep, it's working? Okay, sorry. Um, I'm Lola Hunt, and I'm one of the co-founders of Assembly4. Uh, we run a startup based in Melbourne, Australia. We started two platforms called Twitter and Trist. I'm also a sex worker. Um, and uh, we launched these platforms in response to a bill that was passed last year called Foster Sesta. Uh, the law is made up of two bills, Foster and Sesta. FOSTA standing for Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act and SESTA standing for um, Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act. Um, a few things to note about these laws that uh, on the surface they do sound good, but uh, they have actually done a huge amount of harm to the sex working community as well as the LGBTQI community um, and anyone in the margins basically. Um, the bills themselves, uh, themselves weaken uh, Section 230 in the Communication and Decency Act which um, means that platforms will now be held liable for the content placed on them by third parties. Um, Foster specifically covers um, that, uh, says that um, anything, any platform that is seen to be uh, facilitating or promoting prostitution in, in particular. Um, so as a result, we've seen the uh, banning, the denial, the um, erasing of women, people of colour, uh, trans folk, LGBTQI folk and sex workers off these mainstream platforms, platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, Airbnb, Tinder, um, basically any mainstream platform has, we've felt the effects here. Um, we initially launched a platform called Twitter, which is a decentralized open source platform um, that operates in a very, very similar way to Twitter. Um, the platform uh, was launched to help people, uh, specifically sex workers, who were being shadow banned on platforms like Twitter. Um, shadow banning is when you are uh, essentially banned from the platform without being told. Uh, it's a little bit like screaming into an echo chamber. So you're, you can still post, you're not told that you can't post, but um, you, no one can see what you're posting anymore. So this caused a huge amount of um, chaos in the community because we do rely on these platforms to ensure that we are operating safely and that we can check our clients um, to ensure that they're not violent or dangerous. Um, and Foster Sesta has put this under threat. Um, it's only started to be sort of brought into the mainstream media as something that is gaining attention after um, things uh, like, I guess, on platforms like Instagram, we're starting to see things like the um, hashtag women was banned, as well as um, a lot of other instances like that of exclusion. Um, so we launched Twitter in response to that, and in, within the first seven days, I believe, um, we ended up with 20,000 people on the platform. It's been a year and a half, and we now have 270,000 people on the platform. We've had to cut signups off uh, in the last six months because we are only a team of three. 
um, as we don't want to take on funding or external people who aren't in directly involved in sex work um, or have um, experience in it. Um, so this number would be a lot bigger, but um, we did have to cut that. So we've also got a sister platform called Trist, which is how we sustain Twitter and keep it free and open for those who need it. A lot of the people that use Twitter are um, street-based sex workers or uh, survival sex workers. Um, the survival sex, work sex workers are sort of the most vulnerable in um, sort of the sex worker community. Uh, these are people who really rely on these platforms to ensure that they can do indoor work rather than having to do outdoor work, which dramatically reduces the violence, um, the, the threat of violence towards them. Awesome. Do you want to introduce yourself, Kim? Introduce myself. <laughs> yes, my name is Kyung Mi Oh. I'm from Korea. And I am a, a sex work activist with uh, sex workers. And uh, uh, yeah, and I'm also uh, a researcher at OpenNet Korea. And uh, OpenNet Korea is focusing on freedom of expression. And he, uh, the reason why I, I'm here is uh, to um, uh, give a sp short speech about on, on uh, the situation uh, on sex work in, in Korea. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Alex. Hi, I'm Alex Kamlinov. I am from Research ICTF. Yeah, don't know how to use the microphone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Research ICT Africa is a um, think tank. Uh, we look at the use and uh, access to information communication technologies uh, throughout the African continent, uh, as well as uh, inform good policy with evidence. Uh, we have surveys uh, regarding uh, access to and usage of different ICTs like the internet and the mobile phone. Uh, this is not my domain, but it is a subject I'm passionate about, and I think harm reduction is a very important concept. We all expose ourselves to risks and harms uh, in daily life. Uh, South Africa has quite a huge heroin problem at the moment. Uh, it has a strange name called Wunga, um, and there's some rumors about it that, that it has antiretroviral drugs for HIV AIDS in it. Um, this is, doesn't have any economic logic, but the dealers will mix it uh, with the drug, supposedly, and there have been reports of, of, of people being uh, mugged and robbed for the, drug, for the drug while receiving it from government hospitals. And I think there's a lack of understanding as to what actually heroin is when people jump into this. And, and I think the, the internet provides a, a wealth of information to, to um, seek advice about the harms that you face being a human being, um, as well as to talk about stig stigmatized issues. So I'll pass on to Smita now. Um, it's a bit gross, but I'm going to spit out my snooze. This is oral tobacco. I'm trying to reduce the harm. Hi, um, I'm Smita. I work with an organization called Point of View, which is based in Mumbai, India. And I specifically work at the intersection of gender, sexuality, and technology. Uh, part of the work involves research. Uh, it also involves on-the-ground workshops, uh, workshops with women, young girls, uh, queer and trans communities, as well as sex workers who are based in smaller towns and cities. Um, all our workshop and research is done in uh, re regional Indian languages as well, so I'd be sharing something from there. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists, um, and can we give them just a quick round of applause for giving their our time? I also realized I forgot to introduce myself, so before we get started, I'm Eliza, I'm your moderator today. I'm also from Assembly 4. Um, and before we kind of really delve into this, I think today is should be mostly about audience participation. I feel that's where we're going to seek the most value. So I would like to invite uh, online and offline participation now before we start going into our questions. Is there any uh, online questions? OK, 
Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. Um, so, I guess the first question I'm going to ask for the panel today is, what is harm reduction for you, and what does that mean on the internet in 2020? I think harm reduction is information. So uh, if I, I'm going to consume sugar, if I'm going to consume heroin, if I'm going to consume MDMA, uh, if I'm going to go drinking, uh, I think I need to be informed about what my, my risks are and how to mediate those risks. Uh, not everybody goes out, comes home, and uh, has ruined their body, soul, and mind from drugs. Um, and I believe there are a lot of resources online that, that can help people find out such information. So yeah, there's websites like Arrowind, Arrowid, uh, there's forums, um, and I also think that um, what we see as the dark web, and we see a lot of negativity of the dark web, and yeah, it's criminal activity, it is people selling drugs, uh, but what the dark web does is it, it, it can create uh, a freer flow of information and accurate information, both uh, with regards to the product and within the market. So, yeah, there have been uh, many bad stuff said about the dark web, but I think it also can seriously possibly reduce drug violence, and then there are also, for example, review mechanisms. So people who buy drugs can say, well, this was pure, this was not, this was strong, be careful. Um, and, and this all happens in a safer environment, not on the streets. And what I'm saying is speculative, but I think harm reduction is very important. It's not either or. And uh, without a harm reduction approach that stigmatizes users, that then, yeah, users, uh, be they abusers or sick people or just users, uh, they don't really have a chance to treat themselves healthily. Um, I think a very similar thing can be said about sex work. Um, at the moment, uh, the sort of tactic that's being used um, online is just blatant censorship um, and sort of ignoring the problem or pushing those who are involved in the industry offline. Um, I don't think that this is really the right way to go about it because as we know from drugs and other industries which have been in very similar situations, this only pushes things underground. And when things are underground, we know that the people that are involved in that generally endure more harm than good. Um, obviously, we have a long way to go in how we actually deal with um, things like um, children being on the internet as well as adult content, that's a, obviously another thing to think about, but it doesn't mean that that shouldn't be approached at all. Um, blanket censoring everyone isn't going to help anyone. Um, do you want to? Yeah. Hi. Um, I think uh, when we talk about harm reduction, it's important to note that harm is very different for different people. And it's important to listen to the people who we are supposedly helping to understand what is harm for them and also what is solution as per their, um, uh, as per their understanding of harm. It's, it's knowledge, yes, but it's also localizing the knowledge so that it's actually useful for uh, the communities that we are working with. And um, more importantly, I think when we talk about harm reduction, it's really important to note the systemic issues that cause the harm. Right? Otherwise, the onus goes on individuals, the onus goes on communities, and in case of things like sex work, it goes on the profession, on the labor aspect of it, which is not the actual harm. The actual harm is the systemic violence that is perpetuated against them. And specifically online for sex workers, um, harm would be online violence, it would be harassment which they face, would be repeated calls from unwanted clients, right? And harm reduction would involve listening to them about what is their specific problem, and also acknowledging that there are solutions which they have that we don't know about, and recognizing that and supporting that best. Thank you. I think a huge part of that as well, just on that one, um, is that um, like a huge problem that particularly the sex worker community comes up against again and again and again is that um, mainstream media or um, just tech platforms are particularly bad at it, 
don't involve us in policy making, in um, developing products, in um, reporting about us. Uh, and then as a result, we end up with things that don't actually help us at all. And if anything, they do cause us more harm. So having, um, actually speaking to sex workers will go a tremendous distance, um, but it's just not being done at the moment. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the 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 most important thing is how we we can uh, define harm, because uh, mm, uh, so many people uh, in Korea uh, uh, regard that sex work is very harmful thing in Korea. So uh, and as you as like many other countries uh, in the world, um, uh, sex work in Korea is criminally banned. Uh, the both, both sellers and purchases are punished and so does third parties. So uh, like uh, in the space in SNS, uh, the, the filtering system and the regulation, uh, fil fil filtering like, regulation. So uh, the sharing information between uh, sex workers are basically blocked. So uh, they cannot sh share uh, in the focus of uh, harm reduction. Uh, so they cannot uh, share or uh, share uh, like uh, 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 so many informa uh, so much information uh, uh, between uh, like uh, a client or uh, the knowledge of services uh, couldn't uh, flow uh, on online. So I think uh, it is very <laughs> it, uh, it it read, it is more harmful <laughs> to uh, uh, sex workers. Awesome. Can we cover just to Maggie just to see her opinion on this one? All right. Um, I loved hearing all of these points. And uh, one of the things I know about harm reduction is that it was best simplified by Dan Biggs of the Chicago Recovery Alliance as being any positive change. And we often think about that as being something that's centered in the individual, but it's important to remember that the, uh, the change that we're looking at is always in response to criminalization and stigma of people's behaviors um, especially with broadening criminalization of drug use and also sex work. Um, harm reduction is something that has always been created and sustained by activists. Um, and it has always been built upon the idea of having individual or client-centered services that are underpinned by very simple common sense solutions um, that ultimately are backed by empirical evidence that if you meet people right where they're at. You're gonna have remarkable results in terms of mitigating the possible harms of their behavior, whether that's HIV or hepatitis C, if it's homelessness, if it is mental health or other physical health conditions. Uh, and it's really succeeding in spite of laws criminalizing it and succeeding in spite of a great deal of stigma and an aversion to any kind of program that reduces stigma and increases the social capital of the populations that are being focused upon. Uh, and uh, this really does stand out to me in terms of drug users who have very little social capital um, in terms of trying to receive healthcare services in general. We have this very uh, false dichotomy that people who use drugs are bad and therefore deserve the consequences that they may face. Um, and people who do not use drugs are good and then will therefore experience health. And these two camps don't accurately define human experience when it comes to drug use um, or even sex work in general. So harm reduction is always about finding different steps, um, steps that people can take into their own life that will help them achieve the vision they have for their own life ultimately. Uh, so it's very much about empowerment, um, and helping people find solutions that are comfortable for them where they are right now, rather than focusing on a broader agenda of trying to abolish certain types of behaviors. 
Awesome, thanks for that, Maggie. Um, I think that was a really good introduction to kind of what harm reduction means to a lot of different people in a lot of different scenarios. Um, now, I think we should really kind of step towards internet legislation. As Lola mentioned, in 2018, Foster SESTA passed, and it caused a lot of harm, not to just the sex work community, but to the LGBTQTI community. And I wanna ask the panel, how do we ensure that internet legislation and regulation isn't actually causing more harm? How do we, as uh, technologists, civil society, and private society, uh, prevent this from happening? Yeah. So in South Africa, we had a, um, I guess you'd call it a white paper, uh, a law reform effort uh, suggesting how we would reform a number of laws with regards to, to, to sexual content online and also child sexual abuse content um, and protecting children from pornography. So the white paper or the, uh, yeah, the, the, the document suggested that uh, all devices and uh, network connections or facilities to go online in South Africa were uh, fitted with uh, a filter for children and that was by default on. It would have been a criminal offense if you as a parent decided that the child should not have the filter on their device or if you were to, for example, offer a, a network service like to sell a mobile phone or a network connection or to even have an internet cafe and uh, a child or someone under 18 would use that device and there wouldn't be filtering on it, then you know, someone be, would be liable for a crime. And I think uh, this, yeah, well, firstly, adults have failed to protect children from abuse for most of history. It's nice to put a plaster on it and say this is a problem that exists on the internet, but m most abuse is, is, is likely to happen at home from someone that the child knows. And so if a filter is gonna protect a child from, or stop a child from finding out information about the abuse that they're facing or, or initiating encrypted, by which I mean WhatsApp, um, communications with someone who can possibly help them, then yeah, that's not, that, that, that's, that's not protecting the child from harm. And yeah, if the, this white paper was implemented as law, then kids would simply not go online. It would be too onerous to even have an internet cafe where you could allow children to go online. So yeah, I think another thing we can talk about is, is pornography, and I'd be interested from the audience. Obviously, we're coming from a certain perspective, but some of you might be parents and have some insights into that. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I also work, agree with you. And there, in, in Korea, there are lots of uh, uh, young people who is um, who uh, is uh, who was a victim in in uh, with with their family. So they they left uh, the family and home uh, to avoid in order to avoid uh, the the violence from their parents. And yeah, and uh, uh, because they are, uh, their age is very young, so they, they cannot find proper job, a proper job or uh, the, the job who, uh, the, uh, which can uh, get more uh, price. Uh. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, they cannot get the proper job to for for their living. So, so many people uh, uh, choose to sell uh, selling sex for money, but you know, uh, the, in in this situation, that it makes uh, them uh, very vulnerable. So, uh, through using WhatsApp or another uh, another uh, dating app. They find uh, uh, the client for, uh, in order uh, they find clients, and uh, yeah, as as you can imagine, it is very dangerous to to them. Sorry, could you repeat the question one more time, please? Of course, I can. 
So how do we ensure that internet legislation um, isn't causing more harm than good? I think, <clears throat> I think one of the most important steps to take um, to ensure that the legislation aren't causing more harm is to make sure that there are different people sitting at the table where we are discussing and ensuring and putting in place these legislations. And also, because, and I understand that this is a slow process, but it's important to support that first, right? Because where, why do these legislations cause harm? They cause harm because they are not rooted in reality, they are not re rooted in lived experiences, and they are rooted in this abstract sense of what the internet is supposed to be, uh, in this abstract idea of what harm is. And not just abstract, it's also a very Western, English-speaking um, idea of the internet and what uh, causes harm to these people, right? Uh, I think to recognize that the internet is much more than this would be the first step to making sure that the legislation matches with um, actual concerns of the people and, and actual people who are occupying the space online. So, you know, make space at the table to bring in more people, make money to make bring in more people at the legislation, and more importantly, talk to people who are actually working with people on the ground, right? Otherwise, your legislation is going to be something up in the cloud, um, pun intended in all senses. Um, it's not going to connect, right? Thank you. Awesome. Uh, did you want to say anything, Lola, on this, or are you, okay. Um, does Maggie want to say anything on this? All right, so I think when we look at conversations about the internet, we need to make sure that we're not making broad sweeping policies that are based off of liability or hypothetical concerns. And we actually weigh um, what we can gain from banning certain kinds of conversations and what we stand to lose, especially in light of the fact that a lot of the negative consequences of things are occurring um, regardless of whether or not we create these bans. Um, speaking in terms of sex work, um, we have a lot of conversations that have been banned um, that are absolutely prohibiting conversations that sex workers are having, and yet there is a proliferating domestic trafficking situation that is existing on mainstream websites such as Facebook and Instagram, where people are um, buying, selling, and trading domestic workers and withholding their important documentation. And this was not something that was foreseen. The focus was very, very specifically on sex. And we lost this whole group of people. Uh, and it would be very difficult to ban that kind of speech. And yet people's lives are being harmed. Uh, I don't think that conversation was really weighed uh, properly. And uh, this situation wasn't, wasn't seen as a possibility when it's something that's happening in perhaps greater numbers than the sex trafficking on these platforms. In terms of drugs, we are increasingly banning any conversation between drug users with the fear that there is going to become a marketplace. And while there is something of a marketplace, we're also losing very, very basic and important conversations about safe use, about safe supply, and also the exchange of harm reduction supplies. Uh, there are a lot of places that are very um, resource starved for things like testing kits to ensure the quality of any given um, drug. Uh, overdose response in terms of naloxone. Um, naloxone is a very, very, very safe drug. Its only purpose is to stop an opioid overdose and people depend on being able to access that from online marketplaces, and they can no longer do so. Uh, so when we make decisions based off of fear and liability uh, and hypothetical concerns, we can miss a lot of problems that are happening right in front of our faces, and we're shutting down so many important conversations. Uh, so my, in general, if we want to have some better policies, we, we need to act uh, not out of fear. And that would be maybe the first step. Thank you. OK, so I think Maggie has actually opened up a really interesting uh, avenue for us to go down. And that's how do social networking sites come into play with harm reduction? Um, we were just told you know, that there's a lot of uh, groups and things like that on Facebook and other social media websites that engage in trafficking acts. Um, but how do uh, social networking sites clean up this, uh, their own sites? 
uh, how do we get them to engage with anti-trafficking organ organizations who traditionally won't reach out or have been ignored in the past? Um, or drugs, I should say, as well. Um, does anyone from the panel want to take this? Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I guess I will have a comment about this. I, because we run Twitter, a social network. Um, one of the problems we have faced is trying to find the line between harm reduction and safety. We've reached out to multiple organisations to have uh, help within these circles because we're technologists. Um, we only know how to build stuff. Uh, so. I guess, how do we uh, move forward from this if we can't actually get the right help? How do we ensure we're building appropriate technology? Anyone? <laughs> Maybe Maggie might have a comment on about that one. Sure. Uh, I think it definitely being able to have a seat at the table is going to be a necessary part of this. Um, Speaking from one of my other hats, on the Instagram platform, uh, there were significant bans on the display of certain body parts, uh, namely um, breasts. Um, and there was a large, a large group of people who were in dialogue with Instagram who said it's going to be important for us to display breastfeeding. Uh, we want to talk about the nurturing of children. We want to talk about childbirth. And these are fair topics to, to discuss and to share that they're a significant part of people's lives. And to my surprise, Instagram was very open to having conversations with those stakeholders. And they had a lot of progress simply by being able to have conversations in the room with the people developing these platforms. And, uh, at, but at no point did they reach out to any communities of drug users or sex workers because they were much more heavily stigmatized than people who are parenting a, a young child. Uh, so being able to, to be in immediate dialogue, uh, to be included or to even be considered as a voice worthy um, of talking to developers would be a very key thing to start changing how policies are made. I want to add to this, if mm -hmm. that's okay. Um, um, the, one of the reasons why the platforms are not uh, dealing with communities which are which are prone to harm is also because when we talk about especially around sex work and um, there's, there's this huge stigma around sexuality in itself, right? Um, why are, like, like Maggie rightly pointed out, why are breasts not allowed online? It's not because they are afraid of breastfeeding, they are afraid of women owning their sexuality or like persons presenting as women owning their sexuality. And until you recognize sexuality as a valid part of the digital world, you will not be able to recognize um, harms caused in, in the name of sexuality, right? Like for example, if you will not allow valid consensual sexual expression online, it, would, it becomes much harder to recognize uh, non-consensual sexual expression then. And it, it becomes harder to recognize non-consensual sharing of images. It becomes harder to recognize and, um, and also listen to people who say that they are, they are being violated online, their consent is being violated. Um, right now, what the platforms are doing is that they have this blanket ban on anything related to sexuality. This ranges from um, breastfeeding and, and, and checking yourself for breast cancer, examining self-examinations for breast cancer, which are supposedly the appropriate uses of you know, reasons for showing your breasts uh, against sexting and sharing of nudes consensually with someone else or putting it up online uh, consensually. Right? And also, this is a very gendered problem as well. Men can put up shirtless photos online. That's not a problem. Uh, persons who have had um, a mas mastectomy can put up photos online. It's only female breasts which are uh, condemned online, which are like you know these, this huge thing which has to be covered up and taken down every single time. But if you do not, see that there is valid uses and valid uh, sexual expression taking place online, you will not be able to recognize harms which are coming up. Uh, right now, there is, uh, there is um, cooperation between police departments across countries to deal with child sexual abuse material, right? They share images, they hash it out, and they have developed codes to make sure that it's not even uploaded onto social media platforms. And that is possible because they decided that this is a bad thing. 
when they decide that non-consensual sharing of someone's photos, of anything that they consider private. It doesn't have to be your breasts or your genitals, right? Some people consider their face private. But until they take strict actions on this based on consent and not on protection and not on sexuality banning, it will not change. And that's what is needed um, in terms of, you know, what do platforms need to do, right? And, uh, and how will this change come about? By actually listening to what people are saying. Women are saying that I'm fine with my period blood being shown on Instagram, but Instagram is like, uh-uh, no. So that's not going to work. Um, and I think it also extends like even past um, sharing nudes and explicit images or what is considered explicit images on social media. Um, this actually happened to me two weeks ago on Instagram where um, I had been shadow banned for a long time, primarily because of the content that I was sharing. It wasn't against the guidelines, but it wasn't what they wanted shared in the mainstream. Um, there was a, often in the sex worker community, there's um, tips and tricks of how to sort of remain online and ensure that your platform doesn't, um, sorry, your account doesn't, uh, isn't removed. So one of the tricks that was going around um, a few weeks back was um, not using hashtags, making sure that you don't use emojis in the actual photo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the most shocking one was that if you change your gender on Instagram from female or to prefer not to say to male, you'll be on shadow banned. I did this and it happened automatically. Um, and this is not just the case for me, this has been a case for multiple people, people that I know who are sex workers. Um, and I guess this is sort of a great demonstration of how this isn't just a fight for sex workers here. This is something that we're coming up against as women and as queer people as well. Um, these effects ripple throughout communities extending past sex workers. I wanted to open it up to the audience to see if there was any comments about this particular um, thing. There's just some mics up the front. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, just so we can all hear you. Hi, um, I'm trying to articulate myself a bit better, so bear with me. I kind of understand where you're coming from. Uh, I also give credit to the, the delicate balance between harmful and sex work. Um, so as I'm sitting here, I'm troubled by the title itself because sex work, harm reduction, and you have drug. And I'm thinking like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. How do you start working? And I think the question I have for the panel is, is this conversation in some ways danger, the decriminalization of sex workers over all the world it around how we see sex workers. And maybe I missed, because I came a little bit late, maybe I missed the contextual work. Uh, that uh, I don't know where <laughs> harmful comes in this space, specifically with the ongoing global movement among feminists. And so I'm a bit worried about this conversation being a threatening to the work that has been done around that. And um, maybe harmful was not the right word, or harmful from what, for who? And are we talking about, like, for example, um, digital security, are we talking about what, from what perspective? I think it's, it's very important, otherwise it's, it's you pushing back what has been done so far uh, amazingly, uh, and then you're playing into a very muddy space, so speak, so yeah. Um, I think that, um, I mean, it's not to say that there hasn't been what done, uh, sorry, work done in the space already, like that there's been a huge amount of progress in the last 20 years. Oh. Is it, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Um, there's been a huge amount of work done in the last, you know, 50 years, whatever. Um, but I guess the point at the moment is that we are still in an age where we're being left out of conversation. We're still in an age where policy and laws are being developed without our input and with input from people that may not even have any experience with sex work. Um, and we're still being governed by these laws. Uh, Foster Sessor is a perfect example of this. Um, and the ramifications of that, even though this law was passed in the US, um, people outside of the US have very much felt the effects. 
Um, in Australia even, we, we saw people being denied housing, denied jobs. Um, this is also in combination with stigma. Um, but very, like, the, the, the um, effects of this really do affect everyone and not just, you know, the US. I think that's an excellent point, and uh, yeah, part of the, uh, yeah, I, I believe in this panel, but um, I think it's a terrain we have to negotiate. I think that the, the harm reduction is, is what um, ties it together. We're not saying that sex work is harmful or that drugs are harmful, um, but yeah, so I didn't want to confuse people, but uh, yeah, it's, it is about harm because sex workers experience harm and drug work, people who use drugs also are exposed to harm. And it is really culturally um, relative, well not culturally relative, but um, it, it, these practices are different everywhere and have different meanings. So I, I can, yeah, I, I, I think we could be a bit more nuanced, and I think that it, it really depends where you are. We're in a country where sex work is legal. It's the first IGF I've seen that you can get a beer in the food area. Um, I'm not a big fan of alcohol myself, and I find that a bit weird. South Africa, you, you can only get alcohol from in very limited circumstances, but um, in Germany, it seems to flow like wine. South Africa, we seem to have more problem with alcohol and violence. Those, those two intersect in very dangerous ways. So yeah, I'm interested, maybe, maybe it's something about the social fabric, I have no idea. But th these are, yeah, these are sensitive issues that, that need to be grounded in context. Uh, yes, just from the audience. Um, thank you very much. It's very interesting. Um, I, my name is Susie Hargreaves. I'm from the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK. We're the online um, hotline for reporting and removing online child sexual abuse. And uh, so you're, you're the area and the subject of this um, session is not, is not my expertise. But I would like to say in relation to um, internet companies, social media and people... Um, taking action against child sexual abuse. It's not because they think it's bad, it's because it's illegal. And it's really clearly defined in law. And one of the issues which we have in the UK, we're about to bring in legislation on online harms. There are 23 harms and they're not defined in law. And we're going to have a regulator. And the whole issue around harm as opposed to illegality is how do you define it? So, um, you know, what one person's harm is, is another person's okayness. And, um, you know, a great example of this for us is, uh, for instance, children looking at pornography. Pornography is legal in the UK, but children looking at it is not, and it's clearly harmful. So, um, you know, just trying to get that definition and that nuance is the real challenge and definitely applies to the conversation you're having. But I do think that where you get to very, very clearly illegal content like child sexual abuse, I think that's non-controversial, really. Thank you. I, I, I definitely agree in the uh, respect that it should be non-controversial, it should be very easy to get it taken off, but when dealing with law enforcement and things like that, it's actually been quite difficult for us as organisations to do that, and I think that's also one of the conversations that I would love to see come out of this is better conversations between government, uh, private industry around drug and uh, sexual content. Um, is, did anyone want to respond to this? Oh, there's another question from the audience. Uh, this is more of a comment more than a question, but I think it's important to uh, differentiate between bad and illegal because in some cases they're not the same thing. Um, so uh, all I can think of is examples from like, um, uh, is it Saudi Arabia? Where um, women cannot leave the country or travel without explicit permission from um, their guardian, which is legal there, but the rest of the world thinks it's bad. So that's just my comment on legal, legal and good are not the same things. 
I think uh, uh, we have to have our. Uh, I want to uh, give a speech in a perspective on sex workers because most of the society and most of the country uh, do not take the perspective on sex, uh, from sex workers because and. Uh, uh, in historically, uh, they want to take the lower policy uh, in in on their perspective, uh, not for uh, the sex workers. And I think we need to uh, talk about the law or policy, uh, what uh, the, the uh, uh, which uh, the sex workers really want, and. Um, and uh, we need to uh, talk about uh, uh, we need to talk about what is the definition of safety for sex workers truly. So I beg, I beg, <laughs> always I'm begging for people uh, to take a perspective uh, from sex workers. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. My name is Andrei Sherbovich, National Research University Higher School of Economics. I'd like to ask a question concerning uh, the issues of uh, human trafficking. I think uh, both uh, sex work and uh, drug uh, issues are also linked with the human trafficking. And uh, which efforts could be done by using electronic means uh, for preventing uh, human trafficking, which is illegal all over the world. Thank you very much. Um, so I think that um, regarding human trafficking, we really have to look at trafficking um, on a broader scale outside of just sex. When you look at other forms of trafficking, such as um, agriculture or fisheries, etc. You tend to find again and again that trafficking exists where labour rights don't. Um, and it's really no surprise that there is a lot of sex trafficking that does happen um, because in most of the world, sex work is criminalised. Um, the answer to that, I think, is to start to develop policies which actually do give sex workers the ability to manage themselves and to uh, be able to go to authorities when they need to, to be able to seek the services that they need to and the resources. Um, without this, we're just going to continue seeing human trafficking again and again and again. It's just, it's not, it's not going to go away. We can't, um, similar to like many black markets, if you, if you keep pushing things underground, they're not going to get any better. Uh, I I recommend uh, most uh, I recommend uh, all the people uh, 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 divide uh, trafficking and sex working because sex work uh, sex work is not sex working and sex work is not trafficking and we uh, most of us sex workers. Um, uh, regard trafficking is uh, criminal, and we should punish the trafficking by law strictly. So uh, we always begging uh, uh, and recommend uh, divide trafficking and sex work. Okay, sorry. Uh, may I reply? Actually, one moment. Uh, one sentence. Uh, but uh, what about the issue of slavery, actually? Modern forms of slavery, which also uh, the reasons of slavery is uh, uh, one of the most, is, uh, most popular reasons for people being in, slave, uh, in slavery is uh, uh, forced uh, sex working and forced. Uh, the drug trafficking as well, and uh, we need to. Of course, I need. To, I, I think that uh, uh, we are here for to make more tolerant policies, but we need also to make a bit security balance in this sphere because uh, this is a really big problem 
especially for developing states, to, uh, that uh, human trafficking and slavery is a really big, uh, big issue. So I think we, we should not forget about it. Thank you. I think it's also um, handy to note as well that, um, I mean, we saw this with Foster Sesta when that was passed in the US, um, but in places where regulation and um, has been put in place without sex workers' involvement, um, we have seen an increase in the conflation of um, sex trafficking and sex work. So when we start when we start defining consensual sex workers as trafficking victims, things become very muddy and it's very confusing. So when we can't actually define who is a sex trafficking victim and who isn't, we're going into new territory altogether, right? So criminalizing it and further putting pressure on it isn't gonna help. <laughs> uh, we also have a comment or a question just from over in the audience. I wonder, because it's, uh, it's really both, yesterday we had uh, an event, we were talking about sexuality and governance. And one of the, the community that were named as the one that are not listened to and not able to attend and defend themselves and implement their rights were sex workers, but also people in prison and uh, what to access of the internet, because not all the people in prison are the boss mafia that can, you know, or the politician. But what I find very interesting is the double morality that we constantly apply all over the place. And also, because sex uh, workers, people that choose these workers, I think that we need to stop patronizing which work and what people does, but really to try to understand those people contribute to society, contribute to their lives and their families, uh, whose security is designed against and upon them. Because very often, the fact that there is a stigma, a cultural rooted stigma, then is used to, to put a blanket to anyone else that doesn't fit this one. This one that I would say it's rooted in very specific imperialist colonialist country. Let's talk uh, where from it comes, no? Because there are many cultures and not all the cultures stigmatize at the same way, no? So where are the governments? Because the people in the government use sex workers, yes. use drugs. The scandals tell us every now and then, they don't pay any time the consequences, except if their friends make pay the consequences so that their names are not told. But let's talk about citizens that make choices and use the capital they have. I find very important that we talk about labor rights because this is at the core of everything. We have laborers and workers that are uh, uh, surveilled in their uh, works, and others are just prevented from doing their work. And I think that you are at the front line, no? Of what then is happening to anyone else that doesn't fit. Uh, so we're running out of time, and I just wanna say thank you to the IGF, the volunteers, and the audience for um, coming together and bringing this all together. I'm just going to go around the panelists for final remarks. Do we just want to start off with Maggie? All right. So one of the things that I think we should also consider is that whenever we have laws that they are enforced um, through very racialized, very gendered, and very classed mechanisms. So the people who are going to face the harshest enforcement are always going to be the people who are likely to be more stigmatized or at the lower strata of society. Um, and when we look at difficult questions like trafficking, I think first and foremost, we need to ask why is any given, any given group of people vulnerable to exploitation? And um, what can we do to best address those vulnerabilities? Uh, right now, we have very different legal definitions between smuggling and trafficking. And there is um, a great deal of very interesting and interesting philosophical difference. If you are someone who is bringing um, a consensual worker across a border to do work in a different country, you're smuggling. But that's a word that we more often use for men coming in to do manual labor um, or work of that kind of uh, genre. But if you bring a woman across a border, 
uh, whether or not she chose to be there. Um, if she's working in an industry, she is more likely to be considered trafficked uh, and has no agency. And there's very economic reasons why people are moving from place to place to do the work that they're doing. And the labels that we use to define what they're doing have, um, they reveal a lot about our biases and our perspectives. Uh, and when it comes to, to drugs, I think there's also something uh, very similar. These are topics that are being presented together. Uh, I work in both fields and I love talking about both. Um, but uh, to always look at these labels, to always look at enforcement and to always acknowledge that we're going to punish the people who use drugs who have the least power. Uh, in the United States, we have different enforcement for cocaine versus crack cocaine. And one is more associated with the rich and one is more associated with the power, uh, the, the poor. Um, so how does power play out into enforcement and how can we make sure um, that there's equity in our society? Thank you. Awesome. So, um, mine's super, super short, but I guess um, if you're going to take something away from today, um, just keep in mind that there are over 40 million sex workers in the world right now, um, and you likely will know someone um, that obviously isn't out to you or is out to you. Um, we, every time that you don't call someone someone out for saying something that is homophobic. It does damage to us. It limits. It has a ripple effect, and it limits the services that we can access. Um, so call people out. Keep in mind that people around you are sex workers, and yeah, keep us in mind. No. Yeah, I, I'm fully supportive of this panel and this workshop. I think it's an issue we need to discuss, and I think, um, yeah, uh, there's some kind of pushback from the marginalized uh, about uh, the focus on you know, the harms and, and, and the, the, that, yeah, sex work and drugs create harms, and we have to crack down on them and clean it off the internet. And then, um, yeah, the lady who raised the question also about you know, are we doing damage, and I think she left the room. I, she did raise some uncomfortable questions um, because, yeah, it's, it's, it's very relative and you, you have to look at the, the national environments and, and to, to, to see where policy is, is positive, where policy is informed by evidence and, and how it intersects with the internet. And what I think this points to is perhaps a research gap as well. So uh, we don't actually, a, 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 a lot of the research is anecdotal, um, a lot of the research subjects are stigmatized and, and hard to speak to, so I, I, yeah, we do need to have research and evidence-based policy as to how to counter trafficking of people and how to also allow for people to enjoy their sexual and labor rights and for people also not to be stigmatized for, for using substances when they may be sick or they just may be exercising freedom. I think I would end by saying that I hope at the next IGF there are more sex workers in the room who can speak directly rather than um, people, I'm, because all of us do work and I'm not saying that that's a wrong thing. Of course, we do need to support, but I do think uh, there is a need for making concentrated efforts to bringing certain groups here. Uh, this is sex workers definitely, but also people from non-English speaking background, people who are queer and who are trans, who are non-binary, who are from smaller cities and not the big metro cities. It's also important to have IGF in a place which is accessible, which is not uh, where visa is not a barrier. So I think uh, I'd like to end with that. Like I hope that there are more diverse people here to speak about all of these issues, the next idea. Thank you. Again, I want to thank all of our amazing panelists, and I just want to leave with the final remark. The internet has experienced a lot of censorship over the last few years. Folks who are in the margins are being systemically pushed off the internet worldwide. It is our job to ensure as civil society and private industry, and most importantly, as humans, that we do everything in our power to prevent further harm. Thank you very much.